Well, let us turn again to God's Word in 1 Kings chapter 7. final verse of chapter 6 reads, And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished, that is the temple, and all its details, and according to all its plans, so he was seven years in building it. But Solomon took thirteen years to build his own house, so he finished all his house. He also built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was one hundred cubits, its width fifty cubits, its height thirty cubits, with four rows of cedar pillars and cedar beams on the pillars. And it was panelled with cedar above the beams that were on 45 pillars, 15 to a row. There were windows with beveled frames in three rows, and window was opposite window in three tiers. And all the doorways and doorposts had rectangular frames, and window was opposite window in three tiers. He also made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits, and its width 30 cubits, and in front of them was a portico with with pillars and a canopy was in front of them. Then he made a hall for the throne, the hall of judgment, where he might judge, and it was panelled with cedar from floor to ceiling. And the house where he dwelt had another court inside the hall of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like his hall, this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken as wife. All these were of costly stones, cut to size, trimmed with saws, inside and out from the foundation to the eaves, and also on the outside of the great court, to the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, large stones, some ten cubits and some eight cubits, and above were costly stones hewn to size and cedar wood. The great court was enclosed with three rows of hewn stones and a row of cedar beams. So were the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the temple. Now Solomon sent and brought Huram from Tyre. He was the son of a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a bronze worker. He was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill and working with all kinds of bronze work. So he came to King Solomon and did all his work. And he cast two pillars of bronze, each one 18 cubits high, and a line of 12 cubits measured the circumference of each. Then he made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. The height of one capital was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. He made a lattice network with rays of chain work for the capitals which were on top of the pillars. Seven chains for one capital and seven for the other capital. So he made the pillars and two rows of pomegranates above the network all around to cover the capitals that were on top. And thus he did for the other capital. The capitals which were on top of the pillars in the hall were in the shape of lilies, four cubits. The capitals and the two pillars also had pomegranates above by the convex surface which was next to the network and there were 200 such pomegranates and rows on each of the capitals all around. Then he set up the pillars by the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the right and called his name Jachin and he set the pillar on the left and called his name Boaz. The tops of the pillars were in the shape of lilies so the work of the pillars was finished. And he made the sea of cast bronze, 10 cubits from one brim to the other, which was completely round its height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits measured its circumference. Below its brim were ornamental buds, and circling it all around, ten to a cubit, all the way around the sea. The ornamental buds were cast in two rows when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. The sea was set upon them, and all their back points, parts pointed inward. It was a handbreadth thick, and its brim was shaped like the brim of a cup, like a lily blossom. It contained 2,000 baths. He also made 10 carts of bronze, 4 cubits was the length of each cart, 4 cubits its width, and 3 cubits its height. And this was the design of the carts. They had panels, and the panels were between frames. And the panels that were between the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. And in the frames was a pedestal on top. Below the lions and oxen were wreaths of plated work. Every cart had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and its four feet had supports. Under the laver were supports of cast bronze beside each wreath. 
Its opening inside the crown at the top was one cubit in diameter, and the opening was round, shaped like a pedestal, one and a half cubits in outside diameter, and also on the opening were engravings, but the panels were square, not round. Under the panels were the four wheels, and the axles of the wheels were joined to the cart. The height of a wheel was one and a half cubits. The workmanship of the wheels was like the workmanship of a chariot wheel. Their axle pins, their rims, their spokes, and their hubs were all of cast bronze. And there were four supports at the four corners of each cart. Its supports were part of the cart itself. On the top of the cart, at the height of half a cubit, it was perfectly round. And on the top of the cart, its flanges and its panels were of the same casting. On the plates of his flanges and on his panels he engraved cherubim, lions and palm trees, wherever there was a clear space on each with wreaths all around. Thus he made the ten carts. All of them were of the same mould, one measure and one shape. Then he made ten lavers of bronze. Each laver contained forty baths and each laver was four cubits and each of the ten carts was a laver. And he put five carts on the right side of the house and five on the left side of the house. He set the sea on the right side of the house toward the southeast. Huram made the lavers and the shovels and the bowls. So Huram finished doing all the work that he was to do for King Solomon for the house of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals that were on top of the two pillars, the two networks covering the two bowl-shaped capitals which were on top of the pillars, 400 pomegranates for the two networks, two rows of pomegranates for each network to cover the two bowl shaped capitals that were on top of the pillars, the ten carts and ten lavers on the carts, one sea and twelve oxen under the sea, the pots, the shovels and the bowls. All these articles which Huram made for King Solomon for the house of the Lord were of burnished bronze. In the plain of Jordan the king had them cast in clay moulds between Succoth and Zaratan. And Solomon did not weigh all the articles because there were so many, the weight of the bronze was not determined. Thus Solomon had all the furnishings made for the house of the Lord, the altar of gold and the table of gold on which was the showbread, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the right side and five on the left in front of the inner sanctuary with the flowers and the lamps and the wick trimmers of gold, the basins, the trimmers, the bowls, the ladles, the censers of pure gold, the hinges of gold, both for the doors of the inner place, the most holy place, and for the doors of the main hall of the temple. So all the work that King Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and the furnishings. He put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. In his book on preaching and preachers, Dr. Martin I. Jones tells the story of an eccentric preacher who always insisted on having three heads in his sermons. On one occasion he was preaching on the text, Balaam saddled his ass, and his three headings were, first of all, we find a good trait and a bad character. Balaam saddled his ass, that was a good thing, but Balaam was a bad character. Secondly, he said, I want to say something about the antiquity of saddlery. And then thirdly, there were a few remarks about the woman of Samaria, because he couldn't think of anything else to say. Apparently that happened. And as I thought about this passage, a not dissimilar outline suggested itself. I could begin this evening and say we're going to say something about house building, about ancient furniture and pomegranates. But that wouldn't exactly be helpful, would it? Well, it's one thing to demonstrate on how not to preach in a passage. And it's quite another to preach on it in a way that's relevant and edifying. And that's the challenge I'm faced with this evening. And having read it, you can see that it's not an easy portion to preach on. Let me remind you of the context here. 1 Kings 5 reminds us of how Solomon gathered all the materials for the erection of the, taber- of the temple. 1 Kings 6 tells us how he built this grand edifice. That's how the chapter ends. Verse 38, in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its details and according to all his plans. So he was seven years in building it. 1 Kings 7 begins by focusing on the palace that Solomon built for himself. And then the rest of the chapter tells us about the pillars of the temple and the furniture that was housed in it. That's the contents of 1 Kings 7. And then in 1 Kings 8, we have a description of what happened the day the temple was dedicated. There are three things I want to focus on as we look at 1 Kings 7. First of all, I want to consider Solomon's thinking on the temple. 
because it challenges our priorities. That's my first point. Solomon's thinking on the temple challenges our priorities. And these verses, we have a record of how Solomon built a palace for himself. That's what the first 12 verses are all about. And it's natural to compare his approach to that building project with his attitude towards the building of the temple. As the well-known advert says, go compare. And commentators are by no means in agreement how best to understand this comparison. Consider Solomon's attitude towards the building of his house for a moment. That's described in the first 12 verses. It was obviously a very grand affair, and there were at least five parts to this residence he built for himself. There's mention of the house of Lebanon. In verse 2, he also built the house of the forest of Lebanon. The hall of the pillars is mentioned in verse 6. He also made the hall of pillars. Here's another section. There's a reference to the hall of the throne. In verse 7, then he made a hall of the throne, the hall of judgment. That's where judgments would have taken place. That would have been Israel's supreme court building. Then in verse 8a, we're told how Solomon had his own private building. And the house where he dwelt had another court inside the hall. And the rest of the verse refers to another hall that he had built for Pharaoh's daughter. Solomon also had a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken in his wife. She seems to have been his chief wife, so presumably the other ladies who were part of his harem would have been there as well. So there were five parts to Solomon's house. Now it's not easy for us to imagine what this residence would have been like, because it was erected 3,000 years ago and we don't have any pictures or drawings. However, it's obvious that it was very lavish indeed. We're told about the foundation of costly stones and so forth. In fact, in Ecclesiastes 2 verses 4 to 6, Solomon actually confesses that he spared nothing in the, with regard to the building of this house for himself. Listen to these words, Ecclesiastes 2 verse 4. He said, I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. Now, how are we to interpret this? One way of interpreting this building project, and I'm talking now about Solomon's erection of his own house, is to fall back on something that Dr. Blair actually said in his Old Testament lectures many years ago. And he suggested that because Solomon took 13 years to build his house, while he only took seven years to build his temple, then his priorities were skewed. The end of the passage, chapter 6, says seven years building the temple, 13 years to build his own house. And Dr. Blair suggested that perhaps a spirit of worldliness had already crept in, a spirit that would manifest itself later on in Solomon's idolatry and multiplication of wives. Now, he could be right. Octavius Winslow has written a book on this very subject called The Decline and Revival of Personal Religion and the Soul. And it's ever so easy to backside, isn't it? All we need to do is to do nothing. A failure to watch and pray can soon result in the garden of our souls become as overrun with, becoming as overrun with sin as our natural gardens will fall prey to weeds. So that was Dr. Blair's suggestion, that there's signs here of incipient detention. And that is certainly what happened to the people of God when the second temple was being built. Angus quoted these words this morning. Remember Haggai 1.4, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? One writer has suggested that what is happening here, there is succumbing to the kingdom of stuff, being preoccupied with the things of this world. And that's not right. We're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God must always be first and things second. So that's one way of looking at the incident. However, there are good reasons for interpreting the passage in exactly the opposite way. Because the difference in time taken to build the two houses doesn't tell the whole story. When Solomon was building a house for the Lord, David had already gathered much of the material. Well, that was not the case when Solomon was building his own house. We have to keep that in mind. 
Furthermore, there were a very large number of workmen involved in building the temple. 3,304 men, 30,000 Israelites, and 150,000 slaves. And there's nothing to indicate that a similar labor force was involved when Solomon built his house. And then there's the emphasis of Scripture itself. Twelve verses cover the building of Solomon's house, while Scripture allots 161 verses to the building of the temple. And that suggests that the temple was by far and away the more important of the two buildings. Things are beginning to look a little bit different now, aren't they, when we look at it from this perspective. We must also remember that when God gives Solomon a blank check in an earlier day, so to speak, he chose wisdom. And in response to that, God also promised him riches. So it's natural to interpret Solomon's house, his own personal dwelling, as a gift from God. And if this is what really happened, then the application is very different. And it goes something like this. Firstly, God is a very generous God who gives us all things richly to enjoy. And one of the good and perfect gifts that he's given to us is that he has actually appointed the bounds of our own habitation. Do you enjoy the house you live in? Is it very appropriate to meet your needs? Does it make you thankful to God for his goodness? I'm sure Solomon could have said that, and I can certainly say that. We have to be thankful for God's gifts. And a second application is this. In spite of all his feelings, it does seem overall that Solomon put God first because of the vast amount of energy and expenditure and whatever was invested in the temple. Ralph Dale Davis says the conclusion we come to with regard to this incident is this. Worship is more important than government. He reckons Solomon did put God first here at this point and invested all this time and energy into the worship of God far more than was ever invested in his own house. So different ways of interpreting this. I'll leave it to you to decide what is the best one. So Solomon's thinking on the temple challenges, us, challenges our priorities. The second theme in the passage is this. The pillars of the temple remind us what God is like. Verses 15 to 22 tell us about two pillars which Hiram built. Now this man, Hiram, whatever, was a different man from the king of Tyre. We encountered him on a previous day. This man came from the tribe of Naphtali and he was skilled in working with bronze. We're not told a thing about his spiritual state, but God certainly used him to build the temple. In fact, he was the one who shaped all these pieces of bronze. It was his expertise that lay behind all uh, the inner furniture, manufacturing of the inner furniture, and so to speak. And you remember something similar happened when the tabernacle was instituted? The chief artisan on that project was a man called Bezalel, who was ably assisted by Ohialib. Here are men whom God had given the spirit of wisdom and understanding so that they could fill, fulfill their tasks. And this man, Huram, occupied a similar position in the construction of the temple. Now, we have no idea what a spiritual state was. But we're reminded here of God's common grace. God can give gifts to men and women so that they can create beautiful things which are often used in the service of God, even though these people may remain unconverted. So the next time you look at a beautiful Ferrari or listen to a beautiful piece of music, remember to give thanks to God for the gifts that he gives people in common grace. Even unconverted people have gifts that indirectly give us pleasure. Now, as for these massive pillars themselves, they would have been the first objects to catch your eye as you approach the temple. We're told here that they were 18 feet in circumference. Try and get that in your mind's eye. 27 feet high. Each pillar was topped with an ornate capital, which extended a further 10 feet into the air. And these pillars were heavily decorated with pomegranates. Two very strong and impressive pillars decorated with pomegranates. That was the particular fruit that was a symbol of the promised land. 
Deuteronomy 8 reminds us that Canaan was a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive and honey. So the sight of these pillars would not only have created the impression that the goings on in this temple were solid and dependable, but would have also have reminded them of God's past redemption from Egypt. As for the significance of these pillars, think of the way the term pillar is used elsewhere in Scripture. In 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, the church is called the pillar and ground of the truth because it is the business of the church to support the truth and nothing but the truth. Galatians 2 verse 9 also describes James, Cephas and John as those who seem to be pillars. That means they spoke and acted in a a dependable manner because their lives were grounded in the truth. However, the main significance of these pillars is found in their names. Jacob and Boaz, just as the names Samson and Goliath say something about the cranes in the scripture, in in the shipyard. They remind us that they're very large and whatever the same is true here and the word Jacob Jacob means he will establish it's the same language that is used in 2 Samuel 7 verse 16 where it is translated your throne is established forever so God is the God who establishes he sets things up Boaz means in him is strength and The similar language used in Psalm 21, verse 1, the king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord. So what was the message that these two pillars sent out as folk reflected on their names? They declared that God is the one who establishes us and God is also the one who gives us strength. In other words, God is not only the one who begins the work within us, he's also the one who continues it. We don't really need much else, do we? The pillars of the temple remind us what God is like. And then thirdly, the furniture in the temple teaches us about worship. We've considered Solomon's thinking in the temple, which challenges our priorities. The pillars of the temple that remind us what God is like. Thirdly, we're going to consider the furniture in the temple, and we're going to see what it teaches us about worship. Bunyan has a a, a, a section in his works called Solomon's temple spiritualized. And he includes within it a description of the spiritual significance of the tongs, the snuff dishes, the golden censers, the bowls and the basins and the spoons and the pomegranates and the lily work on the capitals. Now I love that good man from Bedford. He's written many edifying and interesting things. But I'm not so sure that we really are meant to go into such detail with regard to these items I, can, I, I would say that those items I've just men- mentioned have a functional significance rather than a spiritual significance. While the main items of furniture obviously belong to a, to a different category of furniture because their spiritual significance is fairly obvious. So I'm not going to talk to you about snuff dishes and tongs and whatever. We're going to look at the main items of furniture within the temple. And there are four or five of them. The first is the molten sea. Verses 23 to 26. And he made the sea of cast bronze, ten cubits from one brim to the other. It was completely round. The height was five cubits and a line of thirty cubits measured its circumference. Below its brim were ornamental buds encircling it all around, ten to a cubit all the way round the sea. The ornamental buds were cast in two rows when it was cast. A stood on twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. The sea was upon them and all their back parts pointed inward. It was a handbreadth thick and its brim was shaped like the brim of a cup, like a lily blossom that contained 2,000 baths. Can you try and visualize this in your mind's eye? Here's a large bowl that was 15 feet in diameter, seven and a half feet high and 45 feet in circumference. And it stood on 12 oxen with three facing towards each point of the compass. And it was decorated with flowers and lilies. It held 2,000 baths, which according to the experts is approximately 11,500 gallons. So basically this was a massive bath to wash in. Now I still remember Dr. Blair's comments on this bath. And this is what he said. He suggested that God had said nothing about the laver resting on a foundation of oxen. 
So this was a departure from God's pattern. In other words, he interpreted that addition as a sign of incipient backsliding, something that would become even more apparent later on when Solomon openly succumbed to idolatry. Is he right on that? I don't know. The one thing that is indisputable is that this sea would have reminded the worshippers of another sea, the Red Sea, through which God had brought his people at the time of the Exodus. So there was certainly a backward look here, reminding the people of the great salvation that God had wrought on their behalf. There's the molten sea. Verses 38 to 39, we're told there were 10 additional lavers. Then he made 10 lavers of bronze. Each laver contained 40 baths, and each laver was four cubits. On each of the 10 carts was a laver, and he put five carts on the right side of the house and five of the left side of the house. He set the sea on the right side of the house toward the southeast. Five were positioned on the left-hand side of the house, with five on the other side. And verses 27 to 37 tell us they were rested on carts. That meant they were mobile, so they could be moved to any part of the temple grounds. And they held 40 baths, we're told. Verse 38. Each laver was four cubits. Then he made 10 10 lavers of bronze. Each laver contained 40 baths. And again, according to experts, this amounted to about 230 gallons of water. So we're talking about water, water everywhere. And not a drop to drink, so to speak. Now, 2 Chronicles 4, verse 6, tells us what the molten sea and the ten lavers were used for. He also made ten lavers and put five on the right side and five on the left to wash in them. Such things as they offered for the burnt offerings, they would wash in them. But the sea was for the priests to wash in. So what's the central message with regard to this molten sea and the ten lavers? It reminds us of the necessity of cleansing. If we're going to approach God, we need cleansing. We need cleansing from the guilt and the power of sin. And these elements and symbols find their fulfillment in the gospel because it's only the gospel through which we can enjoy cleansing. We could say that this cleansing comes about objectively through the work of Christ unto him who loved us and washed us from our sin. It comes about subjectively through the work of the Spirit because it is only through his help that we can cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And it comes to us instrumentally through the word, as we believe it. Now you are clean through the word, which I've spoken to you. We cannot approach a holy God without cleansing. And that was the central message in this molten sea and the ten lavers. It reminds us that we need cleansing. Another item of furniture here is the altar of incense. Verse 48, we're told that uh, we mention here of an altar of gold. And we know that this was an altar of incense because that's brought out more clearly in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 18. We're told there, refined gold by weight for the altar of incense. What's the significance of this altar of incense? This was another piece of furniture in the temple. Well, in Scripture, incense is close associations with prayer. Psalm 141, verse 2, Let my prayer be set before you as incense. Revelation 8, 4, The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints. And our Lord also confirmed this connection when he called the temple a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. So while certain other items of furniture speak about God's communication with us, that we need cleansing and so forth, this piece of furniture, the altar of incense, speaks about our communication with God both as individual temples of the Lord and dwelt by the Holy Spirit and as a corporate temple of the Lord were to be characterized by prayerfulness. That's the message here. And just as the smell of incense is sweet and savory, our prayers are also sweet and savory to God as we pray in and through Christ. And he invites us to do just that, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. Another item of furniture here is the table of showbread. That's mentioned at the end of verse 48, the table of gold on which was the showbread. Now only one is mentioned here, but 2 Chronicles 4 verse 7 informs us that there were ten of them. 
He made ten lampstands of gold according to their design and set them in the temple, five on the right side and five on the left. He also made ten tables. In accordance with progressive revelation, everything was bigger and grander in, in the temple than it was in the tabernacle. Life throughout the desert wanderings was simple and lowly, but life in Solomon's reign was lofty and grand, both prefiguring different aspects of Christ's reign. And as for the meaning of the table, well, it's still the same as it was in the days of desert wanderings. A table speaks of fellowship. And the culmination of that for us is the moment we gather around the Lord's table. And as for the bread, it points us to Christ, who is the bread of life. These two things always go together. We feed on Christ and we have fellowship one with another. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. God's Son goes on cleansing us from all sin. So the table of showbread reminds us that we have fellowship. We feed on God for our spiritual nurture, but we're also in a relationship with one another. And then there are the candlesticks. Verse 49, the candlesticks of or the lampstands of pure gold, five on the right side and five on the left in front of the inner sanctuary. There's only one candlestick in the original tabernacle, but there were ten in the temple because it was so much bigger. And perhaps this is just another hint that the light of divine truth was shining brighter in Solomon's time than it was in Moses' day. And it would continue to shine brighter until the perfect light of the gospel. This candlestick may symbolize God's word, which in a sense brings light. The entrance of God's word gives light. But primarily it speaks of Christ. Isaiah 9 verse 2, The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Who is the light? Christ, who said, I am the light of the world. And in an indirect sense, we too are conveyors of that light. Let your light so shine before men that they behold your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So here then are three things in this passage. Solomon's thinking on the temple challenges our priorities. Whatever way you think about it, did he spend more time building his house? He did, yes. Was that more meaningful to him in the temple? That's how some interpret it. Whereas others say, no, Solomon's focus at this point was on the temple. But in any case, his thinking challenges our priorities. Secondly, the pillars of the temple remind us what God is like. God is the one who establishes us and strengthens us. And the furniture of the temple teaches us about worship. And the main points that were made here with regard to worship are these. Firstly, we are cleansed as we look to God for mercy. That's the significance of the sea and the ten lavers. Secondly, we need to spend time in prayer. That's the message of the altar of incense. Thirdly, we can enjoy fellowship with both God and his people. That's the the message of the table of showbread. And then lastly, all this was saying that God is the source of light. Because in his light, we shall see light. Bishop Hall applies it personally along these lines. And with this I close. This is what he says. Wherever thou art, O God, thou art worthy of adoration, since thou ever wilt dwell in us. Let the altars of our clean hearts Send up ever to thee the sweetest perfume smokes of our holy meditations and faithful prayers and cheerful thanksgivings. Let the pure light of our faith and godly conversations shine even before thee and men and never be put out. Let the bread of life stand ever ready upon the pure and precious tables of our heart. Lock up thy law and thy manna within us and speak comfortably to us from thy mercy seat. Suffer nothing to enter in hither that is unclean. Sanctify us unto thyself and be thou sanctified in us. Father, as we part from this place, we pray that your blessing would rest upon us throughout this coming week and everything we do and say. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.